A few years ago, I made my way to the border of Bhutan and India after I'd gotten this lead that the local police had arrested someone who was smuggling burlap sacks full of human skulls and tibias from one country to another. See, I'd been on the hunt for the source of vast quantities of human anatomical skeletons that ultimately ended up at world-class medical institutions in the United States and Europe. And I knew that most of them came from India. Now, one estimate that I'd come across was that bone traders were sending 60,000 anatomical skeletons out of Calcutta every year, sold to medical doctors around the world for about $300 a pop. Of course, that's far too many skeletons for any one city to come up with in any ethical manner. Something terrible must have been going on. And while the skeleton business was officially outlawed in 1985, after a train car full of child skeletons turned up in the Indian state of Bihar, child skeletons are rarer than adult ones, so they command a higher price, it was clear that the bones were still making it out of the country. About an hour after I turned up at the police station, the cops showed me to the evidence locker full of these burlap and plastic sacks. He opened them up and I saw something horrible. Two of the bags were filled to the brim with the tops of human skulls, at least a hundred of them. Another bag was nothing but tibias, you know, the leg bone that's below the femur. It all smelled like earth. They'd obviously been dug out of graves and I knew immediately that my trip to this remote outpost was a mistake. I'd found the wrong damn bone traders. These weren't destined for medical schools. They were on their way to Tibetan Buddhists who would make ritual bowls out of the skull caps and flutes out of the tibias. This happened at the beginning of my six year long investigation into the markets for human bodies and body parts. Eventually, I did find the bone traders I was looking for, and I tracked skeletons that were illegally making their way from grave robbers in the hinterland of the state of West Bengal to anatomical dealers in Canada and the United States. I wrote about it for Wired magazine and in my book, The Red Market. And while all of that happened almost 20 years ago, the legacy of millions of human skeletons in anatomy collections all around the world continues to haunt medicine and academic institutions. And we're still trying to reckon with what to do with all of these bones, which is why I'm talking to Sabrina Agarwal today. She's a professor and the chair of the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, who specializes in bioarchaeology. She recently wrote an article in Nature Communications about the issue that is, well, it's strangely close to my heart, asking what we should do with the millions of human skeletons that made their way from India to the United States. Let's just go to the, the beginning here. What is the historical resistance to skeleton collecting in Europe and how was this ultimately resolved? So when medical school started in the uh, 18th century and 17th century, initially people didn't know what anatomy was, right? People didn't know about medicine and uh, medical schools had to start having skeletons and bodies to use to start understanding human anatomy. And so what they started to do without telling the public was starting to take uh, bodies from recent graves, so grave robbing. And the public didn't know. And so as soon as the public found out, there started to be a series of uh, riots, uh, both in the Europe with the first medical schools and then later on in the U.S., uh, as people found out. And they started to get upset that they were horrified, really, that people were being cut up, that their loved ones were being cut up. There was also this idea that you wouldn't be able to uh, be resurrected at Judgment Day if you were in pieces or you would be, you know, not able to be able to do it. So there was a great kind of resistance and freak out when medical school started finding ways to procure bodies for teaching human anatomy. When I was doing research into this, I when my book, The Red Market, I remember coming across accounts of like some of these riots starting when a student, like a medical student, and I'm thinking in like a big, nice academic building, who's like 18 years old, right? Cause that's when we were training doctors and would take the severed arm of someone that they were dissecting and like wave it out of the building at like passerbys. <laughs> right. And, and then you get people who are like justifiably upset, I would say, that at this happening. And and these anatomy riots, you know, 
how many of them were there? And, and, you know, what, what else can you tell me about, like, what did they look like? What was an anatomy riot? Well, the, the first medical schools were in Europe, so in Scotland and the UK. And one of the first cases was a, a case where there was a, a, a two guys that were basically murdering people for the medical school in Edinburgh. So that was a big riot when they admitted that they had been killing people and giving the bodies for donation um, at the medical school in Edinburgh. But in the US, it was more kind of um, related to grave robbing. And you know, some medical historians have said there was about 17 to 20 medical riots over the course of uh, 20 years where people would find out they would literally storm the medical schools. They would be having um, people trying to stop the marshals. They would be trying to take the bodies to take them back to the cremation grounds or have fires. Some of the medical schools would be tainted, closed. They weren't able to practice medicine um, because they were literally hiring their own, what they used to call resurrection men. So all of these big medical schools, including Harvard, Georgia, all of the first medical schools in the U.S. would have these guys. They call their, their own resurrection men that would go out at night and grave rob in order for the medical students to first be able to learn human anatomy. And this is the first medical schools um, that were around, um, you know, in, in the 18th century. This was a huge problem in the like 17 and 1800s. Yeah. How, was it revol- how was it resolved in Europe? So what they did is uh, pass what was called the Anatomy Act, and it was kind of uh, closely in the in the Europe and the first schools, and then again um, in America, they passed these laws that basically said you could no longer grave rob, and that instead you should use the bodies of anatomy of people that were usually uh, prisoners that were executed, people that died in poor houses, people that were um, basically what we would think of today as unhoused. Uh, you know, impoverished, marginalized. And so that relieves the pressure on grave robbing. But really, honestly, until they started donation programs of consent, modern, what we think of as 19th century consent, people started to feel, okay, they're not going to start grave robbing. Um, but that at least relieved some of the pressure, but there still wasn't enough bodies. They still were having all these new medical schools open all across, uh, you know, the Western world in Europe and in America and North America and Canada. And there wasn't enough bodies, even with those provisions of being able to use people that were otherwise um, unclaimed or uh, from poor houses or executions. So if you were, say, a British colonial officer, let's say, and you realized that there weren't enough bodies coming out of your graves in England, what would you do to, say, increase that supply? So what happened is that uh, when the British Raj occupied the colonies, and India being the largest one of these colonies, they started the first medical schools. And they started these medical schools in India, um, you know, in the kind of mid-19th century, so 1830s. They had already been there for 100 years, uh, occupying India and the different colonies. And the first medical schools open up, and they decide that they um, have this opportunity to start collecting bodies to teach human anatomy because they were starting to train people in India, but also export bodies. So export cadavers, export skeletons. And what happens is that you start having this huge opportunity of exporting skeletons across to all of the colonies uh, in the UK. So all as far as New Zealand, as far as Australia, you have all these skeletons being exported. And suddenly it changes the industry. Nobody needed to you know, rely upon the bodies of the poor or the destitute or the executed or the unclaimed in the Western world. And they started this new industry of exporting thousands, tens of thousands of skeletons all the way up until uh, British independence and India, uh, Indian independence with Britain. Um, and then the industry continues even bigger in India after that. It's sort of crazy how like modern globalization actually starts, isn't it? Like, you know, obviously the British Raj was exporting all sorts of stuff out of India. And then they were like, well, we have all these bodies. Do you know where these bodies were coming from uh, in that British time period? Yeah, I think it's important to remember that, you know, uh, it, this is a period of extraction, right? It's co- it's a colonization of a country where you're going in. It starts in with the Indian Spice, Spice Company in India, and they're exporting food, they're exporting goods, they're exporting cotton, but they're also exporting and uh, exploiting people dying and bodies. And so it's really a part of the, the, the power, the biopower, literally, of, you know, uh, the British in India being able to control bodies with medicine. So medicine, modern Western medicine was not practiced in India. They had their own system of medicine and Ayurvedic medicine. So they take over and eclipse the, you know, the, the other indigenous systems of knowledge, uh, systems of uh, medicine, and then they replace it with Western medicine. And they also use the people to procure the bodies and to actually make the bodies. And so they're, they're looking that the anatomy schools in India are um, 
looking at all kinds of pathology. They're publishing monographs saying, hey, look at all these great, you know, cool diseases. They're not helping people necessarily. They're not treating people. They're like using the colony of India as their own personal medical textbook of all yeah. kinds of fantastical diseases. They're presenting it like it's an exciting and incredible thing. And then at the same time, you have extreme poverty and famine. Um, and right, you know, when you get to World War II, you have extreme famines, um, particularly the Bengal famine, where millions and millions of people died. And everyone, you know, was quite aware that it's one of the famines in India that aren't related just to um, the environment and climate and water. It's actually related to World War II strategies during the war that Churchill had in Britain in order to uh, deprive parts of India of food. And so you have millions of people dying, and it's another opportunity to literally watch people die slowly in the famine and then collect their bodies for medical use abroad and ship them out. That's, it's crazy that, that, that this is what happened, but it is. It's exactly what happened. Uh, and, you know, obviously, the Churchill manufactured this famine. Millions of Bengalis right. die. And now you have this resource. It's funny. After I wrote the, the you know, uh, The Red Market, you know, this book comes out and a lot of people are reading it. I used to get so many emails mm -hmm. from people every time there's a natural disaster. You remember this earthquake that happened in Haiti? Uh, right. You know, what was this? You know, uh, I guess a little more than 10 years ago, I would get probably 30 emails from people in Haiti being like, hey, I've got a lot of bodies. Do you know where I can sell some skeletons? And I was like, well, oh. this is <laughs> incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, I'm not right. an organ broker. So anyone listening to this, please remember, Scott Carney does right. not sell organs. But it's crazy that people have this idea and it's suddenly this arbitrage scenario. But then, you know, after 1947, so India gets its independence. Right. And it, and it seems that this industry just doesn't go away with the colonial masters running away. The business, as you said, actually grows. So what happens the industry after grows. 47? Yeah, I mean, it expands and it grows. And I think, you know, people always thought, oh, well, it's a legal industry. India likes to export bodies. But what people didn't know until, you know, a lot of your work that exposed this market was that people were actually being, uh, again, grave robbed in India or, you know, maybe even murdered, taken without permission. And that even when permission is in place to take people in India, you have to remember these the, the people are giving permission because they're in dire circumstances, right? They're getting offered something that would be the equivalent of 5 or $10 to give their loved one up instead of doing a regular burial away because they can't afford it. And this money is huge. And so you have this, this system that is capitalized by what used to be the little middlemen in India during colonial rule. And then the colonial, you know, uh, masters come out, but I'm sure they're still benefiting, right? The, the trade route was already made, the exportation route, but you get these guys that otherwise were small middlemen that capitalize on it. And so, yes, there is someone else in the hierarchy that's taking over this industry of making money, but it's taught to them, right? It's a system of exportation and demand on the side of the Western world. The demand at that point is so high that every medical student in uh, the Western world expects to get their bone box skeleton for about $100. You know, I took human, human anatomy, you know, maybe about 35 years ago. And when I got my little skeleton in the wooden box, there was a little paper that said, hey, you want to buy your own little skeleton? Send us a check for $100, or I think it was $95, and you can get a full skeleton or a half skeleton for less. And here's the address. Um, and so it was these what, Wait, what, what year did you go to medical school? <laughs> When I took that human anatomy class, it would have been, um, you know, probably the late, so late 90s or early 90s, early 90s, like 1990, I took it. And, you know, the market was already, so it was probably a piece of paper before the end of the ban in 1985. So it was an, an old piece of paper that had been in this little box advertising, hey, you can get your own skeleton. But they didn't tell us. And I thought, oh, okay, maybe I should get my own skeleton, you know. And at that time, I didn't even assume where it was from because we have bodies that we're using donated from informed donor consent in the medical school, and we're using those for um, soft tissue dissection. And you assume as a medical or pre-med student um, or an anthropology student that the skeleton you're looking at is coming from a same donated program. It doesn't even occur to me that it's from India. And most people before you wrote your article had no clue where those skeletons came from. They assumed they were regular informed consent. Yeah, I, I find it fascinating that you were look. Yeah, your your box of bones comes in 1995 when actually the ban to Indian, you know. So in 1985, the Indian government found uh, several train cars full of child skeletons, yeah. 
And it was in the state of Bihar, which is one of the, the poorest states in India, especially at that time. And and the the fee, the feeling was in India at that time is that it's that it's too many child skeletons to have harvested legally or even just grave robbing that this had to be murder just like the you know you mentioned that there were these two murders that happened in the 1800s which was Burke and Hare uh you right. know these were Edinburgh hoteliers who offed two or three of their guests and sold them to an, uh, anatomy programs in Europe well it seemed like this went industrial in the in the 80s and then india was finally like okay let's stop let's stop doing this export and yet it still continues it still goes forward and now we're d- left with this legacy of what millions of doctors and anthropologists and other bone buyers with skeletons absolutely everywhere Right. Millions of skeletons, you know, a con- really conservative estimate. If you just look at what happened post-independence in 1945, it, there's at least 2.4 million skeletons that were exported into India. And we know there was millions more before 1945 that were already exported during British Raj outside of India, within India. So we're talking about millions of skeletons that still exist. So even though people realized after the ban, okay, this was not really ethical donation. And after you wrote your paper and people are like, okay, this is really bad. This is really gross. People are still using those skeletons because they're the, the primary resource for people to learn human skeletal anatomy. So they still use them. How many, So you're at Berkeley right now. How many Indian skeletons do you think are in the collection at Berkeley? And what are they used for right now? Well, Berkeley is unusual. So Berkeley is a, a medical. Uh, Berkeley does not have a medical school, but UCSF does, San Francisco, which is affiliated. And our medical school was one of the more, um, you know, not one of the early ones like Harvard and the other ones in the U.S. It was one that started um, probably in the late 19th century. And there were a small number of skeletons at the medical school at UCSF. And then when there was an earthquake in 1906, for about 50 years, they moved human anatomy from San Francisco to Berkeley. So the Berkeley campus does have an anatomy department and some skeletons. Most of them are post the ban, post post independence. Um, So a small number, I'd say like 20 skeletons. So not very large compared to other collections. Mm -hmm. And part of that is because I think um, the medical schools tend to use a small number of skeletons because they need to just teach their medical students for one or two weeks the human anatomy of the skeleton. They don't spend a long time, medical students. The people that spend the most time with classes and learning the human skeleton detail are actually anthropologists and comparative paleontologists that need to learn it. So those collections sometimes are even bigger. So Berkeley is unusual. And we also, of course, have a a very uh, sordid history of using the bodies of Native Americans in the state of California's archaeological skeletons to teach human skeletal anatomy. And that's something that has laws that have now changed and no one, you know, no, that's not legal to do anymore. And that, there, you know, a lot of these campuses that have those kinds of collections are repatriating these, giving them back. So Berkeley's yeah. unusual, but a lot of the medical schools on the East Coast could have much larger collections, hundreds of skeletons. Like the class that I took in Canada, that's human anatomy. Um, there were maybe two or 300 students in the class and all of us got a bone box. As I understand it, um, Berkeley's history is quite tortured. I mean, there was this, and this is a digression, I guess. You know, you, we can talk about the one of the last, I believe, Ahi Indians. It was Ishi who sort of appeared out of the wild and, and showed up at Berkeley and was like, hey, what's going on? And I believe Krober is it, is it Krober who takes him in. And, and this last Indian who was sort of like, I guess you could call it the last wild Indian, last wild member of this tribe, almost becomes like a zoo pet at Berkeley. You know, he's, is he exhibited? Like, what what, what, what can you tell me about Ishii? Because obviously my memory of, the, of his whole tale is not there, but I do know that he ended up in an anatomy collection. He did. And, and you know, it's not my area of specialty, but when Ishii was around, he was at the UCSF campus in San Francisco, where Krober was as well, where the Museum of Anthropology was at the time. And a lot of these, you know, early anthropologists um, were guys of their time, right? They did things that today we would think of as not really uh, ethical or kosher. And he actually worked at the museum. He had a room at the museum, Ishii himself, and he would do um, it, not really exhibits, but he would do experimentations where he'd show the public how he would make tools and look at it. But of course, there is this idea that he's almost like a, a, a captive um, display of showing what it looks like. And there was this idea in all of the country that Native Americans were going extinct, 
And um, be, we know the reason why is because of literally their genocide, their forced migration assimilation that was happening. And people thought, well, they're going extinct. Scientists at the time said they're going extinct and we should collect everything we can. And this mean, meant collecting their language and taking it and recording it. It meant collecting their objects, their cultural belongings, and of course, their bodies. And taking these bodies illegally without consent from Native American populations um, and putting them in museums. And Berkeley is one of the oldest collections on the West Coast. There are collections on the East Coast and tens of thousands of human uh, burials, Native American sacred burials with their sacred uh, belongings were taken without permission and kept for study with this idea of what we used to call salvage archaeology, that things were being salvaged and kept. Um, and in the late 90s, of course, Native groups fought for many years that this is, this is wrong. And because Native American groups are sovereign nations, they were able to pass a law that said, um, you know, what, what they call NAGPRA law, the Native American Grave Protection Act, which uh, protects their graves and their belongings from being taken and recognizes that they're sacred, um, their spiritual importance, but also their, their cultural patrimony, that they can keep things that are theirs and should be given back. Wow. What, it, it, it's, it's so interesting to think about these legacies, which is of course what you're doing in your article in Nature, because you know we have these crimes that happened in the past and we're trying to reckon with like, oh my God, we actually have real calcium, like human calcium bones in our collections uh, that were like, in many cases, what we would consider a crime today. Like the origin is a crime. And now the, the and it was a profitable business. And now we're, we're like, oh God, what do we do? What would you say is the current, let's say, total value of human skeletons in the world today, now that they've gone from people to product? Uh, from India, particularly, you mean, right? Like from the... Yeah, let's talk about India. But if you have a global figure, I'll be interested in that too. You know, I don't know. If it, I mean, first of all, you can't put a, obviously a number on a human body, on a human life. But because it is a market, and it was a market for so many decades. So when they first started the industry, if we just start with India, um, when they were exporting skeletons to India, they were maybe $50, you know, before the war. And that post-independence, they maxed out at $100, $120 for a full skeleton. That's how cheap it was to prepare and export a human skeleton. So there was a number on it. Post the ban in 1985, of course, the prices went up like crazy because where were people going to get human skeletons to, to use for teaching? So they had to be getting them from legally informed consent donated places and not from India. Um, or maybe, you know, India or China. And so the value of these things go up exponentially. So if you were to try to procure for educational studies and informed consent human skeleton today, they're about $10,000. They're a lot. Wow. So if you were to put a number of on the 2.5 million skeletons that are out there that are from India, they're very valuable. They're billions of dollars. But of course, what we're trying to move to is not putting a number that they're valuable because they're not available. But if you have informed consent, there should be no value which is what we've tried to do in most of the Western world, is that when people donate their body for science, for anatomy, it's not with any, any numeration of, of money or exchange or value. It's only the cost of being able to export it to different places. And of course, the exportation of human bodies needs to continue because medicine still, there's medical schools all over the world. People are learning. Surgeons need to practice all of these methods, like innovative methods, like laparoscopic surgeries get practice on human bodies that are donated legally. So there's a, there's still a huge market of this mm -hmm. trade, but you want to not have a value given to what the body actually is. Sorry to break in just for a second here. Organ trafficking, I just, sometimes it feels like this stuff is not real. Like it's totally fake. Like people would never buy and sell body parts. And for six years, I was in the middle of all this stuff. I was living in South India, whole villages next door to where I live, refugee camps, actually. Every single person there sold their kidneys uh, over the course of like, you know, a few months. And I documented it all for National Geographic. It all, it all ended up in, in my book, uh, The Red Market. And I just want to say that to some degree, being able to work on this has been a huge honor for me, but it's also sort of left me really understanding a thing that I, I don't think I ever really wanted to understand about the movement of a human body from a, a person into a commodity, just like a material object. And, and to a degree, it's the, the center part of almost all of my research. And these are the sorts of, of, of passion projects that investigative journalists 
get into, and it, it takes over our lives. And, and I'm breaking into this podcast moment to say it would be awesome if you would think about supporting the work that I do, the work that I've done over the last 20 years. Uh, I have a Patreon go check it out. You get early access to, to my videos and, and you let me keep on doing this sort of stuff going back to India. And I think, honestly, and I'm saying this for the first time publicly right now, I think I want to go back and dig into the red market to see where it's come in the last 10 years because things have only gotten worse since I, I started writing about it. And I, I, I need your help to be able to do this. So go check out my Patreon. Go check out my newsletter. Like and share this. And now we're going to go back to this amazing interview uh, with Sabrina Agarwal. Why is it that we need uh, to study on human skeletons at all? I mean, right now we have we can 3D print you up a, a, a human skeleton, I'm sure, pretty easily. Uh, what's the value of actually getting a real human bone? So I think that there's levels of... of what you can learn from something that's 3D modeled. When you have a 3D model printed bone, you don't have as much detail. The resolution on the bone is not as exact. That's one thing. The second thing is, is that humans vary. So just like our, our physical outside parts of our bodies, our faces, our skin care, our hair all vary, the skeleton varies because every skeleton is unique. So there's modern human variation. For a medical doctor, it's not so important because what he's learning, he's he's not working on a skeleton, right? He's working on a living person. So he needs to know what a bone looks like at different ages, uh, what a pathological bone looks like. He doesn't need to know what 20,000 different bones look like all over the world. So someone that's a biological anthropologist or an archaeologist or forensic anthropologist that's studying human variation skeletons all over the world to try to be able to identify someone that's died in a mass disaster or identify uh, changes in time with health and disease or activity patterns, they need to know what different skeletons look like so they know what's normal and what's not normal. And the only way you learn that is by looking at a lot of um, natural, real human skeletons to know the variation difference. The, the thing is that most students don't go into those fields. It's a tiny, tiny number. Right. And so no, most classes do not need to have a large number of human skeletons to look at. They probably don't even need a lot of real skeletons. A lot of medical schools today, even for human anatomy, are using no bodies at all. They're using all virtual reality. Um, they're looking at photographs where, I, you know, the, the human anatomy, they can do dissection now virtually without real with real bodies. So I think in most circumstances, for most expertise, you don't need to be trained to do this. The thing is that we've been, it's a habit. It's almost like you've been um, domesticated to be apathetic to this way of collecting people's bodies. You know, I think that whether it's looking at uh, archaeological skeletons that were taken from people that were impoverished, people that were poor, people that died in wars, people that were collected, people that were Native Americans, or you have this red market of people from South Asia. It's always people that are marginalized and it's it's racialized, it's, you know, it's scientific racism. And we've become so complacent that we're like, oh, okay, now we recognize that that wasn't good. And we're not doing that anymore, but we're not really reconciling with the fact that there's still this historical legacy in how we do things. So it's thinking yeah. about changing the practice of how we educate and how we teach our students about the history and also what we you do know, in the classroom now. You know, it's not, one of the things that, that that really gets me or got me when I was, you know, in India doing this research was that it's not just a historical legacy. Like, it's still very common in India, if you're at CMC, which is Calcutta Medical College, to need a human body to dissect. And, and you can literally go to one of those anatomical uh, shops, or at least when I was there, you could literally go there. Uh, this was in 2007 when I was really into this research. Um, I could go to a morgue and be like, can I buy a body? Uh, I remember in Bangladesh, they said, sure. And they just produced me one. Like within mm -hmm. about five minutes, I had an anatomical skeleton right in front of me. I was like, is that a woman? I was 50-50 guess. I was right. And they were very impressed. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, and then I looked, you know, in, a, in another place, I, I, I found that there was this cast called the domes. And the domes are sort of this, um, you know, an untouchable cast who is involved in burials. And there were people who you could you would go to the anatomy shop and they would introduce you to a dome and for like about 25 bucks i think it was about a thousand rupees um that that he would sneak into the graveyard at night and still get you so to say that this is over 
or it's a, just a legacy is not true. The legacy is more, it's harder to get those bodies from India. You know, it's harder to get them now because the export bans are around. Uh, but, you know, they're still moving. You know, for instance, I, I recently found a, on, a, on a website, which I'm not going to tell you which website this is for ethical reasons, um, you can buy um, tranches of a thousand human teeth I don't know where you get a thousand human teeth from, but, and, and, and it, it will be, <laughs> all right. Yes. We're going to ask you that question, <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can get a thousand human teeth and they'll arrive at your home in, in, yeah. in what looks like really bad artwork, like just really kitschy artwork and it'll be full of teeth and it'll, it'll show up in your home. And I, and I think, I think the cost is about $300. Um, but since you know where to get a thousand human teeth, Sabrina, where do you get a thousand human teeth? Well, I think that there's two parts. One to remember is that an India, with a couple other countries still in the world, has their own anatomy act. And so unlike uh, in the U.S. that you just can't claim somebody off the street and make them into an anatomical body or skeleton for educational purposes, in India, if you're unclaimed in a lot of the different states in India, in the country of India, if it's 48 hours, you can claim somebody. So India is a big population and millions of people die every year and a large number of those are unclaimed and those bodies can go for science. And India has the largest number of medical schools in the world and they still do human anatomy and they export to you know the bodies. They are not allowed to export the skeleton. So if you went, you probably could get a body, but you technically should be stopped at the airport from being able to take it home, right? Because you wouldn't be able to take your skeleton home. Um, presumably I've often you said... I've often said that the one uh, the one outcome of writing the book, The Red Market, was that it's no longer legal to export um, human remains in your carry on baggage. That's right, right in the Delhi airport now. I was like, yes. oh, look, I did something. But I think yeah, you, can you can't you them. can't be. Yeah. I mean, it'll be harder to take take a human skull, whether it's archaeological or modern in your bag uh, mm -hmm. going across across international borders now. But they still use them in India. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, while we have different Western standards in anatomy, we're trying to really push what is informed consent without duress, you know, that it's yeah. something that everyone's giving with consent. We can't expect every country to suddenly be at our Western standards. And I don't know if it's necessarily appropriate to expect every country to do what we think now. We didn't we didn't 100 years ago or 200 years ago when we were taking their bodies. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but they still do that. The other thing to remember is that along with India producing the largest number of bodies for human anatomy for tissue, not just bones, the U.S. is also one of the largest countries that export human bodies with consent. Um, because a lot of countries, including um, India, China, and the U.S., again, send these bodies for medical education. Things like yeah. teeth are less regulated. So because teeth, you don't have to be dead to donate a tooth, the laws are different than exporting a whole human skeleton. So China, for example, today and India, you can get human teeth. So I, you know, I know this because, again, when I teach in my class skeletal anatomy, I have a very limited collection, mostly plastic, a few a small number of teeth that I got donated from people when they had extractions, modern teeth. Um, I have very small material I teach with them. My students sometimes would complain because they've taken classes elsewhere. Or they want to look at lots of cool skeletons and I explain why. And one of my grad students said, we should get a whole bunch of teeth. You know, you can get them really easy. You can get teeth on. So I looked online and for dentists that are learning and want teeth and you can get bags of teeth. Like you say, online, you can get bags of teeth, but you have to think about where are these teeth from? Are they really all people that had dental work? that were extracted. You don't see cavities on them. They're not like teeth that are falling apart. They're great intact teeth because they're being taken out of people's mouths and probably being sold again for a couple, what we would think of as a couple dollars. So who is the industry that's asking for these things, right? Where is the market coming from Sabrina, for people to I still am, ask for these things? I am just like floored by this market, the way you're talking about it. Do you think that these are coming from live people or recently dead cadavers? I think there's probably a mix. I think there's probably a mix. I wouldn't be surprised. I don't know how many people have really, you know, there's still a market, as you know, a red market for things like uh, organs, for hair, um, uh, for things like teeth. And I think some of these things are coming from living people. And I think there's a market that people are buying them. 
Oh my God. I, I, I'm just having this vision right now because you know, I'm doing a lot of stuff on YouTube and now I know that someone's going to watch this video and they're going to order a bag of teeth for $300 <laughs> and it's gonna, there's going to be a thumbnail being like, look, I got a thousand teeth. Let me show you how I know it's going to happen. Well, and I think I, there's I, also, you, you bring up that there's also a historic market, right? So there's a market also of not just things now coming out that are modern, which are much more highly regulated. And there's an ethical conversation about whether or not different countries should decide, should a person who wants to accept a, a monetary amount be allowed to sell their organ or body part? And I think that's a different bioethical discussion, right? If somebody in a country is willing and wanting to sell something, it's hard to tell them they're not able to do it, that you think they shouldn't. But there's a whole secondary historical market of all of these tissues and teeth and, de and bone that are for the past 200 years collected. And there's a secondary market of this stuff going on. As you well know, I, I do, and that's actually in in a way the next question is like how many of these you know after you know you had said that there could be billions of dollars of skeletons if they were all sold at the, the current market rate, but you know most of these skeletons probably went away, right? They got lost in attics, they're maybe thrown out, like they're the the supply has been constrained, and so it's there's no way to know how many of these older. Uh, skeletons are actually around. But this secondary market is actually, it seems to be thriving, or at least, you know, I never really know if just my Instagram feed is like very hyper specific or not, but it's, <laughs> but, you know, because of the algorithm gets stuff, but it, but it does seem like there's this company called John's Bones out of New York, right? And, and John Ferry is a, a young, charismatic, and actually like really nice guy. If you've ever talked to him, he's really, really nice. Um, but he's also selling, you know, walls full of human spines and, and, he, right. and he says, and, 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 you know, skeletons and fetal skeletons and all these like really like sort of intense objects that he says are all ethical. Are they ethical? What, what are we supposed to make of this? Well, I think that, there, you know, you're right. There's not as much uh, of these historical items available as there once was because things have, you know, been used, they've decayed, they've been already, um, disposed of or buried. But there, even if you take the millions and cut that in half and think 50% of them are there, there's still a significant amount of skeletal material and an anatomical material. And some people like uh, John Ferry have created an, a market, have created a, you know, a selling market. I think what's interesting is that you know, he's still making a profit. It's not a nonprofit company that's saying, okay, we have all these bodies um, we should not stigmatize them. We shouldn't just throw them in the garbage. We should still use them for educational purposes. So we're going to continue to use them at the institutions or only give them to medical institutions or some kind of rules. He's selling them to people that are making art, that are doing just creepy collections of things. And in fact, when he first started marketing his business, it was marketed as kind of a cool, creepy thing. You know, it was it was a social media generated market that he had created and he got a lot of criticism for it. And he at some point switched his, <laughs> um, you know, his marketing claim to say, well, this is an, an ethical way of reusing things, but it's not just educationally oriented. So I think there's a lot of people like me that are bioarchaeologists that are looking to push you know, more ethical conversations around how we think about the human body and how we use it and what are appropriate ways to um honor people that have died, what are you know the appropriate ways to rebury them, return them to people. Um, or you know, we're not happy with people using this for a financial gain for non-educational purposes, right? And that's very hard. He, you know, he's open to selling them to anyone. And he also shows all the bodies. So there's also this idea of how do you how are you replicating and continuing violence against people that were uh, systematically taken and either killed in genocides and used. Um, whether they're from archaeological or modern populations, you're continuing violence against them okay. by mm -hmm. dramatically showing cool pictures, by stringing them up in a room mm -hmm. with multiple spines, by separating their body into different body parts and selling them. You're objectifying people. And so this yeah. kind of secondary market is continuing that objectification and violence against people rather than trying to return their humanity and talk about who they are. Yeah, and like... And, you know, we see this over and over again, not just in the skeletal market. You know, I, I, I follow people who like do artwork with human bodies. And, and there's also this market for ritual items. You know, at the beginning of this podcast, I, sure. I began with this story about, you know, if you go to Varanasi right now, you can go buy a, a skull cap, like the, 
this part of the skull, I can show you photos of bags of them um, that I've seen. And, and, and that's also commodified in this, uh, you know, an anonymous way. Like, I don't know whose skull cap I have, but I know that I have a burlap sack full of them. Are, are those the same considerations when they're happening in India, in Bhutan, in Tibet, as if they happen in the States? Like, like how, do we, how do we parse this, like, really difficult ethical territory? I think we have to start with the idea that it's not uh, unethical, you know, unethical to just uh, deal with the human body, touch the human body, collect skeletons. There's a lot of cultures all over the world that have different spiritual rituals of how they treat the body. Some cultures uh, continue to hold on to skeletons and bodies. They keep them at the table. They keep them on their mantle. Um, they make them into ritual objects like you're talking about in Bhutan and Tibet and if those are individuals that are their own ancestors or individuals that are, you know, again, it's all about consent. Where did the people come from that they're making into oh, these no. objects? These are not consent. The ones I've <laughs> seen are not consensual. They they come, you know, in, in a, I mean, at least the ones that I've seen are, are, are literally stolen from graves in in uh, in India. You know, I can show you the photo. I'll, I'll put the photo on the screen right here of, of these skull caps. Right. You don't get a burlap sack full of consensually, you know, oh, this is my grandfather's skull and I'll give it to you for $15. Like, no, that's not what happens. It's still actually the same process of criminal stuff. It just happens to be couched in a cultural tradition uh, that goes back also thousands of years. So, you know, and you also have the agori, the, these sadhus, uh, you know, these sort of more sinister figures in in Hinduism, who also are not asking for informed consent when they cannibalize uh, a body in Varanasi, which also I've seen. So, I mean, are, are we sort of picking and choosing our ethical standards? I mean, no one's going to go to an agori and be like, don't hold that skull because they're scary. Um, you know, like, wh what are we doing here? I think that in you're right in countries where people are still using a illegal market to procure things, you know, for Tibetan churches or something or monks that want to get stuff and they get a middleman and it's illegal grave robbing. That needs to be obviously monitored in the country that these things are or the origin is. But I think there's also this um, bias and this ignorance about what the body is in places like India, and people often associate agoris, which are um, these kind of spiritual men that live in places and in burning grounds in India, in places like Varanasi, um, as these kind of uh, people that are kind of creepy or like to touch skeletons. And part of that is just for tourists, right? You know, these, these sure. you know, it's yep. a tourist market. People yep. go to see the burial grounds in, uh, in you know, former Benares to see them and think that, oh, they're going to think it's cool. And there's, you can literally get a tourist, v uh, tourist package to go and see them. And so these agoris are not the original agoris and the people that were spiritual Brahmins that actually were part of spiritual practices of, of skeletons. But there's going to be a secondary market that I wonder how much of it is pushed by, again, Western mm -hmm. tourists that are saying, I want to go to Tibet and get a human skullcap bowl. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how much of it is necessarily that there are spiritual leaders in any of these countries that are saying, please go and grave rob so that we can make spiritual items. Yeah, I think a lot of this is being driven is, is being driven again by Western uh, tourists and Western ideas of what people's death rituals are and this kind of misconception. You know, people assumed even when they were procuring bodies post-independence that it was doms who liked to deal with bodies or yeah. it was agoris and other aesthetics that are just used to it. And they love cutting up bodies and they love collecting them, which isn't true, right? When when mm -hmm. when the when the British came to India and started um, modern human dissection, they had to implore the doms and force the doms right. as slaves right. to help them to help them do this. They were scared. They were horrified. They didn't do human dissection. So a lot of this conception of what we think of as death rituals is also something that comes from colonial ideas yeah. about what Indian rituals are in different places in different countries. Yeah. And, you know, for just another sort of related example um, to what exactly you're saying of, with, with these tourist markets, um, there are the shores, which S-H-A-U-R-E or S-H-U-R-E, which are um, shrunken heads, right? In the 1920s, sure. shrunk, there, we had all of these native uh, indigenous tribes in South America who had head-taking rituals, also in New Guinea, head-taking rituals. And that was a thing that was there. And, you know, frankly, it's creepy. It's horrible. There's all sorts of real problems with, in my opinion, head-taking rituals. But 
regardless of what was ever going on culturally, they became objects where Westerners would be like, oh my God, I could go to New Guinea or Brazil and I could buy a shrunken head from a tribe. And wouldn't that be a cool thing to have in my anatomical collection back home? And then you had tribes fighting each other to collect heads in order to supply this tourist market. To secondary market, yes. So you're removing the original spiritual, cultural significance of funerary Mm -hmm. rituals or ancestor, you know, veneration, and it gets warped. It's almost like you're taking something and you're putting in a westernized colonial settler influence that's distorting what's natural Mm -hmm. in a culture. And what we think of then is, oh, this is creepy. It's creepy to collect skulls. It's creepy to touch skulls. You know, um, historically, Catholic priests in the medieval, you know, before the medieval times, the Middle Ages and the early centuries used to routinely open burials and take out skulls and scapegoat bones and move them and push them over. Um, So what we think of as um, unethical is very much a contemporary idea that's, you know, comes from our modern positionality where we are now. Mm. So, Sabrina, what do we do with all of this information that we've talked about? Because I, 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 one thing I'd, I'd just like just to push back gently on is that I'm not sure that somebody who had their head cut off who was a tribesman in New Guinea by the enemy tribe and had their body cannibalized gave consent in that situation. I think that there are consent I- issues even among what something might be culturally appropriate in that in that area. I don't think that person wanted to be, have their head turned into a ritual object where the belief was that their soul would be sucked out and they would be given jaguar power. You know, depending on I'm actually mixing and matching. <laughs> tribes here. Uh, But, you know, I I think that consent happens at multiple layers. Uh, Regardless, whatever's going on with the tourist market is clearly a problem. Um, But so, but, but like, regardless of all of this, how do we solve it? Like, you know, we have this situation and this is what your article in nature is sort of about. Like, you know, we, we obviously have a, a legacy of really problematic, massive volumes of human material. How do we begin to even unpack it and, 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 and get to a place where we might have a solution that we're all happy with, or a lot of people are happy with? I think we have to accept that there's not one solution. I mean, I think not, there is not one easy thing that says, okay, we're just going to give all of these things back, or we're going to cremate everything tomorrow, because that's also not culturally sensitive, right? Everything has to be contextually um, understood. Right. So even when we're thinking about things in museum collections, we have to stop and take the time and think, can we actually figure out um, if there is no consent or we think consent was problematic? Who are the descendant community that should give consent and should decide how we treat the bodies that we have now? And that means not just saying, okay, the person that owns the museum or the university or the collection can just make a decision. It should actually engage with the people that are what we think of as the descendant community. And a descendant community can be an actual lineal descendant. It could be going back to an actual village. So if you think of your example again, where there are things like uh, these skulls that were taken because people thought it was cool and shrunken skulls, you know, if you know the actual village and the community, can you go back and say, these were your spiritual ritual ancestors, how would you like them return? That's a, a conversation. Sometimes you can't figure out who a lineal descent is. With all of these collections of uh, 200 years of South Asian bones from India, we don't necessarily know where they're from. And we can't just knock on the door of India and say, hey, we, we now realize this was kind of a creepy, really uh, crappy, racist thing to do to take all your bones. Here, take millions of skeletons back, right? <laughs> India doesn't have the ability to do that. They have you know, a huge population. They have millions of people dying every day that they have to every year that they have to worry about. So then you think, what is the local descendant community? Maybe there's a community of care at the institution, in the city you're in, in the neighborhood you're in, that you can confer with and decide what to do. So I think there's not one solution. I think the problem is that we need to be very contextually specific about the problem, you know, the the different collections that exist and engage with different descendant communities. That's the only way we can ethically decide what to do. God, do you think that they're going to do it? Because when I when I hear you saying this, I mean, I agree with your position here. Um, I also, you know, you could also try to do DNA testing on skeletons, and I'm assuming you can get DNA material out of skeletons um, uh, and, and be like, okay, this looks like it came from maybe a Bengali. You know, you know, you could just, right. you could guess. Um, uh, but I just don't see that happening for millions and millions of skeletons. I don't see the, the the resources to be devoted to this problem for better or worse. Um, uh, and I also I also find the image of, of sort of humorous of, uh, of of a ship landing at say India Gate in Bombay or Mumbai and just dropping off 
<laughs> all these skeletons <laughs> back home, right? Skeletons, yeah. Really and are. also dropping them back to a country and to that may not be in the same Western perspective that we are. So we have this yes. guilt that we we imported all these bodies, whereas India still, you know, uses human skeletons within yeah. their own country. So they, you know, they have their own perspective. So we have a historical almost guilt that we're dealing with. And I think that it's not pragmatically easy. You're right. We're not suddenly going to figure this out in one year or five years or 10 years. It's going to take decades. But I think what we're seeing is that all across the Western world, all of the professionals in human anatomy and medicine and anthropology um, have realized this is a problem. And they're now being very considerate of how they are treating these human skeletons. I think one of the things that bothers me the most about the the skeletal market from India is that when you wrote your book and you're like, look, this was a bad market. You guys all have these things. Look at the horrible way these uh, bodies were acquired. Everyone was like, oh, this is gross. This is terrible. And then they didn't care. Yep. They didn't do yep. anything. And that's the part that bothered me. And these skeletons were really made to, to be anonymous. They have no right. labels on them, you know, like all the other things that were collected, whether it was, um, you know, Native American skeletons, things that were from different, uh, you know, uh, wars and different parts of the world that people collected because they thought they were cool or interesting. They're labeled. Yeah. The ones from India were literally physically made to be white, mm -hmm. empty, blank slates with no identification of who they were. And that bothers me. That's the part that I think bothers me the most. And the idea of just disposing them or putting them in a closet without ever thinking of them as people yeah. is the thing that I think as probably from my own position as, a, as an Indian woman bothers me. I feel like yeah. we at least should be able to tell our students, hey, do you know that these are actually from India? This is a woman. She looks like she died when she was in her 40s. She's probably right. from this part of India in this time period. I think even that to me returns a little bit of humanity. So I think yeah. what we see is a shift in how people are now treating these bodies. And to me, mm -hmm. that's a big success already because the yeah. the this is at least making people aware and making our students aware. What we lost was the empathy to care about mm -hmm. the kinds of things that we were using. And I think if we're restoring that, even if there isn't a perfect solution, and if yeah. we can try to stop these things from going into a secondary market where they're being made into jewelry or curiosity in people's homes or something or cabinets or art, mm -hmm. which I do think has a different ethical um, mm -hmm. perspective than something being used for educational purposes. Sure. I think even that's some success. You know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because I I'm, I spent a lot of time thinking about these issues as well, and it, it, it that movement from a body a human into a commodity is exceptionally disturbing for me because then you have the markets of capitalism. You know, once you can strip the the humanity from something, then you're like, well, it's just a product. Like it's a, this skeleton is just a product, and you could hold a skull in your hand, and you can be like this is a skull. This is not, you know, James a person, or a person. Right. And, right. but th this, these are also the problems that, that, you know, the same ethical discussion we're having also affects live tissue markets, right? When we, when you get a pint of blood from the red cross, you know, it is, uh, anonymous. It is type O type B positive, whatever it's maybe got a, a platelet profile and whatever else, but you don't think about who that blood comes from. Instead, you're told, um, you know, you, you're, you give up blood because it's the gift of life and you're going to save someone on an operating table. You know, this is the idea from the, right. the, the, the blood givers um, view. And, and sometimes they're okay with it, but they also don't realize that America is a net blood exporter. And we, we export a tremendous amount of blood components and, and things that go to the market and they're sold at, I believe what the going rate is at $800 a pint right now. I mean, it's, it fluctuates all the time. Right. You don't realize that you're going, you're giving to a company the Red Cross, that is that is a valuation of billions. And when you have a chief executive who makes, a, you know, what is it, like a million dollars a year is her salary? Uh, we have this tendency to commodify bodies immediately. It's, it's blood, it's organs, it's bones, it's skin grafts, it's hair, it's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the skeletons is just merely one part of this broader, what I call the red market. It, and and I, I you know, I've had conversations with people who are like, well, if someone gives their bodies willingly, then who cares? Like, it's fine. We, they, they've decided that their body is a market, is, is, a, is a thing that could be sold. But then when you meet people, I know that you have, um, his name's Lawrence Cohen, is that right? Uh, at at yes. Berkeley, right? right. Another, who looks, has looked into organ trafficking. The organ you trade, know, yeah. 
you you think about how uh, a, a poor person, you know, in a sort of a, someone who lives in a refugee camp says, okay, yeah, I'll sell you my kidney for $600 or $2,000. I've never heard for, of more than $2,000 in these cases. But like, what choice, how can that person give informed consent? They're, they're right. already in an economically disadvantaged position. And these just problems just spiral and spiral and spiral. And, you know, I, I don't really want to dump them on your feet because you're, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but there's, I don't see like a, a fully easy way to, to resolve it. And, uh, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to see some way to, to honestly reckon with what's actually going on with human bodies. Yeah. I think that the, the modern trade of the red market is different than the historical trade. I think that, you know, it's an easier thing to solve about how we're going to handle the historical market. And of course the modern market is a very different complex, you know, beast. And I think what people are trying to move to is having at least informed consent, not be a, a monetary exchange with someone that's under duress. And you're right, in these third world countries <clears throat> where we have people that are donating kidneys, donating organs, blood, hair, um, you know, even uh, even virgin populations, as they call them, in the pharmaceutical industry, where they test oh, all of these yes. medications on people that haven't been tested on anything and they give them some money. You know, what are the ethics of all of those things? Where you mm -hmm. are, you're getting informed consent, but it's people that are in a position where they will accept anything because they need right. to, to live. You know, what are the ethics of that? And I think that's something that as a global country, we need to reckon with and think with. At the same token, the other argument is, well, we were okay taking people's kidneys. Um, you know, when we colonized them, we were okay with selling their bodies. And now that they are actually able to get the consent and take the money themselves, we have an opinion on it. Ah, <laughs> so there's a counter yeah. argument that, right. you know, we seem to have a high and mighty idea of what we think is ethical and we want to implement on, you know, you know, the global north now says we have a very ethical stance that we expect you to all follow. And yet when we wanted to take things and give people nothing, we had an opinion. And now that they are actually part of the market and they're able to actually get compensated for their decisions, we're trying to implement what we think is appropriate or not for their country. And that's also ethically problematic. Oh, I think. man. Just making it just impossible for us to solve. Yeah, no, I, I think, you know, Sabrina, <laughs> I really appreciate just having this conversation with you. It's really was enlightening. And now I know that I can buy a thousand teeth on the internet for like 300 bucks. I don't know so. if it's a thousand teeth, but um, <laughs> it's it's definitely it's definitely something to, to not yeah. not think is great. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's great. Um, and, you know, for anyone who's interested, uh, I'll put a link to uh, your article, Sabrina's article uh, in Nature in the descriptions down below. It's called The Bioethics of Skeletal Anatomy Collections from India. And uh, yeah, I, I just really appreciate your time. And uh, for all of those listening, this was Scott Carney Investigates. It was also Magnetic North. I haven't really decided on the title of this. You'll see it's changing, but it's one of those two things. From Pokey Bear LLC, Denver, Colorado, thank you so much. <laughs>